paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. Welcome to the Nick Bryant Podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Melissa Farley. She's a psychologist who is also the Executive Director of Prostitution Research and Education. How are you doing today, Melissa? I'm doing good, and thank you so much for having me on your show. I was uh, just in San Francisco, and I spent a wonderful night there. Actually, I'm not in San Francisco now, but uh, I'm in the Cascade Mountains. So the backdrop is actually quite deceptive, but I really wanted to get the woods in, but it kept on screwing up the uh, fidelity of the lighting. So um, so I ultimately settled for the Golden Gate Bridge, which I drove over uh, earlier this week. You've got the vibe. I got the vibe. I, I'm filled with uh, peace, love, and brown rice. <laughs> what, what you're saying, that's where I live, peace, love, and happiness, huh? That's it, yeah. And, well, and especially as you go into Northern California and get into Oregon, you're you're going to come across a lot of peace, love, and brown rice. And although you know there might not be some peace and love in certain areas, you, you can definitely get a lot of brown rice. So, Melissa, you were uh, brought in Eileen Warnos, the uh, quote unquote serial killer, um, who was actually put to death by uh, Jeb Bush when he was governor of Florida. You were, the, the defense attorneys brought you into that case. Could you talk to us a little bit about it? Sure, I can. Um, let me back up a tiny bit and say that she was, um, the way many of us who are advocates and researchers and um, who care about her as a human being, She's a prostituted woman, first of all. She was, I would never use the words, quote, serial killer to talk about her. Um, she was a woman who uh, was in some of the worst kind of prostitution that's out there, which is prostituting on a major highway in Florida where uh, she was picked up by truckers and, and anybody who happened to be driving by. And it's, you know, there's certain parts of the world where it, it, uh, there's large parts of Africa where there's huge highway prostitution. And it's kind of known to be an especially dangerous, isolating kind of prostitution. I think anybody who's been in prostitution knows that the more isolated you are, the more danger you're in whether that's being locked into a, a sex buyer's house or picked up by somebody on a highway that, you know, they can drive you wherever they want. Um, it's, it was dangerous. And she had a fairly typical life of many people in prostitution, emotional neglect, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse. She even spent an entire winter as a homeless child around the age of 13 or 14 in an abandoned car in Michigan, which I, I, I just always remember that detail about her life. But like many people and you, I saw the Nick Broomfield film, The Making of a Serial Killer about her her trial, her first trial, where um, she, you know, how to summarize her life briefly and then talk about what I got into the middle of. She was, um, 
she was betrayed by people her entire life, starting with her caregivers and school systems and prison systems. The people did not see her as a person in need of assistance. And like many women in prostitution, she developed a hard shell. She was, she was betrayed by her lover, a woman. She was betrayed by the police, by multiple sex buyers. And I, from all that I understand, she was, uh, she had hundreds and thousands, even thousands of men who paid for sex with her. And of those thousands, she defended herself by killing uh, five or six, I think it was six men who she very, very clearly stated in her trial, she was protecting herself because she thought she was going to get killed. In one case, one guy had a wire around her neck that he was pulling the ends of. And in other cases, these guys had guns and like many women in prostitution, she had a weapon that would protect her, a gun, a knife, and she killed these guys. Then in her trial, she was a very emotionally disturbed person with some serious uh, psychiatric diagnoses that result from the kind of life that she had lived. And she, she was... Uh, glommed onto, I guess is what how I would put it, by a uh, evangelical Christian who convinced her that the best thing to do would be to confess to murder rather than to plead uh, to a charge that would enable her defense team to save her life, because there is the death penalty in Florida. So she was betrayed by this woman who convinced her that it would be a good thing to, to give up her life and not try and fight for that. And then uh, the defense team brought in a psychologist who, in my opinion, exploited her for writing purposes, which is sometimes a risk in our profession, Nick. You know, people like to write about the cases we're involved in or we we uh people do that ethically it's it's not an ethical thing to do um and many of us choose not to write about interesting or in this case entertaining this psychologist went on to write a kind of a pop psych book about warnos's life so she felt betrayed by a psychologist, by her defense team. Uh, in Broomfield's film, you can see her lawyer toking on a joint on the way to the trial it, while Broomfield's interviewing her and the, him in the car. Sounds like he was prepared. <laughs> <laughs> for the worst. Yeah, he was kind of preparing himself for the worst, not to defend it. His client, unfortunately. So uh, she got sentenced to to death. And uh, she got, yeah, she was convicted and sentenced to death. And then the defense team made an, another attempt to bring some other people in, including me. And I said I would be happy to do anything I could to uh, help with her defense because I've, taken on a number of that kind of cases in my career of women charged with very serious, women who are prostituting charged with serious crimes, including homicide. And um, I, I talked to her team. They were asking me to, to interview her and do what's called a forensic psychological evaluation of her that would talk about her life and the pressures on her, why she saw human beings as a threat across the board, all of us. But by the time they asked me to talk with her, Nick, um, she didn't want anything to do with 
one more psychologist. So she refused to talk with me. And I have always felt very sad about that. <clears throat> and I've always felt that Jeb Bush executed her and has blood on his hands because um, he could have chosen to spare her life, keep her in jail the rest of her life, which is also rather horrible. And I don't think she deserved that either. She needed treatment and support, but um, she didn't get that chance. The Menendez brothers. Um, oh, I was just. They, they take a bad rap for killing two people. Now, Bush, Jeb Bush, and George Bush, when they were uh, governors of their respective states, um, Florida and um, Texas, they, uh, via capital punishment, killed scores of people. So, at least uh, quantitatively, they're way ahead of the Menendez brothers. <laughs> Who did not get sentenced to death? Who did not and get sentenced to death? Did you just see? I saw, uh, funny you bring this up. You may have seen it too. Two days ago, I saw there is a report of a third person who claims that the father of the Menendez brother sexually assaulted him as well. In other words, it's corroborating victim testimony. And uh, that gets into the whole issue of why more men don't talk about sexual assault, which is the reason this guy gave for not coming forward for all these years to help in their defense. With, um, with Eileen Warnos, um, a serial killer, he chooses a victim, he stalks them, um, and then he kills them, they're pretty much defenseless. And Eileen Warnos's case, um, she was she was reacting to violence. Um, she wasn't stalking anyone, she, was, she wasn't choosing anyone to kill. Um, and actually, it's kind of interesting, one of the individuals who really tried to hurt her, who she killed, was a former police chief. Yeah. In, in Florida, which in my investigation of trafficking, um, the police come up quite often as uh, perpetrators. That's for sure. Why. And many, many women in prostitution talk about, for example, having uh, having a blowjob extorted in exchange for non-arrest. Cops do that a lot, enough to give police departments a bad name. And um, it should be charged as a sexual assault and the cop should be fired without a pension. But there's, you know, just to go back to your point about Warnos being different from other people called serial killers, the big difference between her and serial killers, in addition to the fact that she was defending herself from lethal violence, is that she wasn't turned on by the murder. That was... That was not in her lexicon. She was uh, she was killing in self defense. Serial murderers almost always have uh, sexual arousal to murder, or it's combined with sexual arousal somehow. And with her, Nick Broomfield had concluded that she was uh, clinically insane. Um, and that she shouldn't have gotten the death penalty. Um, you came to that conclusion yourself? I, I would say, you know, I, I can't diagnose somebody that I'm not, you know, talking to, but it sure looks to me and to many sophisticated observer, experienced observers who were lawyers who were around her, that she had many, many psychotic symptoms. So yeah, uh, Broomfield put it in a different way, but it, yes, it's the same thing pretty much. And did you see the movie that came out about her uh, entitled Monster with Charlize Theron and uh, Christina Ricci was her girlfriend who gave her up? I couldn't stand to look at it. I, I have never seen the movie. 
I the title upset me a lot. Uh, and the the inability of so many people to see her life as not very different from many, many, many other women who are described as trafficking victims or prostitutes. I would not call somebody a prostitute. I would call them somebody to whom prostitution has been done to them. They're prostituted or they're prostituting. But um, it, it upset me too much to even see the thing. So no, what did you think of it? Well, I mean, Charlize Theron put a, I mean, her acting job was pretty amazing. She put a human face on Warnos. Well, I mean, here's this uh, beautiful lithe model um, and the way that she was able to portray Warnos, which seemed to be like antithetical to her life, um, was, it was pretty interesting. Um, but ultimately, I think that it, it's, in some ways, it, it's hard to defend a murder. But I think in the case of Eileen Wernos, um, here's someone who's very damaged, who said that she was defending her life. And obviously, with some of her victims, she was definitely defending her life. Um, do you think that she ever used lethal force? in a case where she wasn't defending her life? If you read her accounts of all six of those uh, homicides, she was defending herself. And unlike you, I, I would not have a hard time defending murder. Uh, I, I, I don't have a problem with it. If someone someone is trying to kill me, if someone is trying to kill somebody, that I love, that I'm standing nearby, I I actually wouldn't have a problem with that. I didn't. I, I don't know. I don't have a problem with a somebody who's enslaved killing somebody to escape. You know. Yeah, yeah that's what I meant. I mean, I didn't. Yeah. Wasn't. Yeah. No. Using the I term think, murder as as a categorical yeah. pejorative. My my impression is that. Uh, she she was not uh, somebody who. I mean, if you if you want to understand women's rage at men and men's power over women in general, then you really do want to take a look closely at what women in prostitution have to tell us about these men who buy them and pay for them, and verbally abuse and degrade them and hurt them and cause tissue damage and enjoy that. It's, it's, uh, I've been listening for 25 years now to what survivors of prostitution have to say to me and teach me about their experiences and the pretty woman image, which is really what Warnos is juxtaposed in opposition to, right? She is the opposite of Julia Roberts, you know, happy experience finding a nice, a nice John to walk off in the sunset with. Now that is partly because of that movie. That is many women in prostitution's dream, that they'll find a nice person who will save them and get them out of there. Doesn't happen, you know, really doesn't happen. The best that can be hoped, as I understand it, from women in prostitution is that the dude will come fast, pay what he agreed to pay, and get the hell out. So a nice dinner, silk sheets, the Hyatt Regency, that is not what, she, what women in prostitution are looking for. They're looking for money. They don't have, they don't have enough. They don't have shelter. And uh, often they don't have food. We have women in the US right now 
that are turning tricks for a tank of gas or a McDonald's hamburger. Literally, do this, I'll get you a hamburger. Do this, I'll fill your tank up with gas. So this is not a choice of, uh, you know, something that Warnos chose to do. It was for her and so many other women in prostitution, a last ditch alternative that's got some pretty frosting on top of it that is the propaganda we read every single day from pimps and pornographers. <laughs> Sorry to go on there. That's all right. Well, um, Warnos was molested at a very young age and the, the average age of entry into prostitution and other uh, like pornography is 13 years old. So it, by the time that they're even 18 or 90, by the time they're adults, it's that lifestyle is so deeply ingrained in them. You know, you know, something uh, you just reminded me of is a pimp once said to a journalist who was writing about pimping, he said, hey, their dads and stepdads uh, teach them what to do and what they're worth. I just give them graduate school in that same thing. And there's a lot of truth to that. You know, almost, you know, estimates go from 80, 90% of women in prostitution have experienced childhood sexual assault. Usually not from one or two people. Usually they are vulnerable kids that are exploited by neighbors, church members, you know, a lot of people. They're unprotected. Well, the Centers for Disease Control surmises that 25% uh, of women in the United States have been molested as minors, and a number of people think that that's an underestimation of, of the problem. That's so, right, that's all women. So you take this particular group of women who are channeled via a history of sexual assault, via a history of emotional neglect and abuse, via a history of racist lack of opportunities in school and jobs, via a history of poor education and training. You get all these forces coming in, sexism, racism, and poverty and the history of sexism and sexual assault, like I say, is through the roof with this particular group. <laughs> well, you've gone to bat for other women um, that have committed, I, I, I believe murder um, at the hands of their abusers. Could you tell us a little bit about those cases that you I could tell you about a couple cases. Um, I won't mention, they're both in the US, but I won't mention the states where they happened in. Um, both women have given me permission to talk about their cases a little bit. Um, if, if, they, if I wanted to use the case to, to help people understand what they went through and why they might kill, um, in both cases, these women killed sex buyers who were threatening them, um, harming them, uh, threatened much larger than them, threatened to beat them up. And in one case, uh, it was, we could talk for two hours about the failures of the legal system to protect the most vulnerable people in the US, Nick, you know? Um, but that's the case. This woman had a nightmare public defender who just had her own problems and wasn't capable of giving her a strong defense. And um, there was an inadequate defense. There was uh, many other reasons. But this kid grew up, you know, when she w was in a neighborhood in the United States that if she stepped you know, three steps in the wrong direction and got in another gang's 
turf, she would be shot. She grew up with no protection in her family and all kinds of people uh, sexually assaulted her. She watched her mother murder her father as a toddler, after which she stopped speaking for a year. Um, and her mother later was a crack addict and sold her, sold the, my client. Um, and then she had a series of tattoos on her body. Women are tattooed by pimps these days, just the way cattle are, as a symbol of both ownership and what they're a constant reminder of what they're worth. They're a piece of meat that's worth a few bucks and that's it. So she had these tattoos on her. She had once tried to get arrested in front of a police station because she was so scared of rival pimps that were terrorizing her and one threatening to kill the other, kill her. Um, so uh, she was involved in, in a, a car theft where she helped with a car theft, but in the process of a car theft, a homicide was committed by someone else. And when in some states in the US, when a homicide is committed in the process of another felony, you get the full force of the legal system against you. This is something I've seen repeatedly is it's getting a little better now because Police forces are learning that part of prostitution involves brainwashing women into being kind of like coerced assistant pimps, if you know what I mean. You know, you can, can if you have that kind of control over someone's body and their life and their mind, you can convince them of pretty much anything. Most of us don't understand what it's like to be under complete control by another person. And so we just think, as Judith Herman has said, well, they are of an inferior moral character to me, or I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so scared. But most of us haven't been in those situations. So we don't understand the kind of mental control that can be exercised by a combination of physical terrorism and grandiosity and you know, mental seduction, which is what happened to her. And um, even though she was a minor when this crime occurred, the the public defender didn't didn't try and keep her from being charged as an adult. And I was I was not able to help her out and to get the charges reduced enough so that she would get sent to another state than the one she lived in. Um, and she's still locked up many, many, many years later. It, it's a sadness, constant sadness to me, and I'm sure to her, because she had a kid who's now grown up. Then there was another case where a woman defended herself lethally against a sex buyer and um, somehow her legal team and I worked together to tell the story of her life, like I tried to in this other case that didn't work out. But we told the story of her life and um, the jury heard it. And what's interesting to me is the forewoman of the jury was a like a a uh, 22-year-old white woman, and the woman who was accused of homicide was a 25-year-old African-American woman. And that jury rejected every single charge of homicide and manslaughter because they thought it was a justifiable homicide. She was being threatened by a large sex buyer who was enraged that you know he had taken some drugs and he couldn't get it up 
Nick, this is one of the most dangerous situations for women in prostitution. When a John can't get it up and he takes his full rage out on her, first by demanding his money back, even though she's tried to make it work with everything she's got, and it doesn't. You take you take certain drugs, it's not going to happen for a guy. And that was the case. Well, there was testimony about the drugs in his system, which are known to cause erectile dysfunction. But he demanded his money back. She wouldn't give it back. And he came after her in a very physically threatening way, cornered her, and she had been attacked before so many times that she carried a little gun and she fired the gun. And it, one of the important pieces of the testimony, of course, was that she was, she said she was terrified he was gonna kill her. And you can see the bullet holes that went from the top of the motel room to the floor from where her hand was shaking so much. You know, that jury got it. They got her life, the danger of her life, the danger of that situation, why any one of us might do that. And they they rejected all of the charges and she walked out same day. It was great. Well, I want to thank you for what you've done on behalf of... Uh prostitution and the advocacy of uh, prostitutes. Melissa, you and I have uh, spoken about this new phenomena of woke and uh, identity politics. And many commentators think it's coming from the left, which, which it is, but you would consider yourself uh, a feminist and a lesbian and someone who lives in San Francisco. So that would automatically make you of the left. Um, what, what are your What are your thoughts about about maybe? <laughs> what are, What are your thoughts about our culture that's becoming woke? Well, my my approach to dealing with the woke insanity is let's let's be clear what we're talking about here. Let's be really clear about the meaning of words, because to me, uh, woke in, in my field, in the field of prostitution and in the field of the political ideology that declares, almost like a religion, that men can really turn into women and women can really turn into men like a dogma of belief, like Jesus rises from the dead. Um, it's about defining words. I mean, in, in these two areas, which is where I've focused on the issue of prostitution and wokeness and the issue of, um, is it possible for men or women to turn into the opposite sex? Of course, my answer is no, um, that's not possible. But it's about words to me. And if you know anything about the field of prostitution or how trans ideology has gotten translated very in very confusing ways, um, I think it's necessary to understand that this, these the, these threads of thinking come from postmodernism, which says nothing exists except in your mind. I mean, that's what postmodernism is. It's a nihilistic, uh, bizarre approach to life. It also, both of these approaches also are strongly influenced by what I would call liberal, neoliberal capitalism. In other words, everything's up for grabs, everything's up for sale, uh, competition and selling stuff. And 
let the highest bidder win in all cases. I think those two threads make it real confusing. So part of what I feel like my job as a somewhat intelligent person is to just define the crazy use of words. I just read an article this morning, Nick, that pointed out that children are not migrants. You realize people are talking every day about migrant children. We're talking two-year-olds here. These are families that are fleeing, according to the Migrant Clinicians Network, and they're absolutely right. These are little kids that are fleeing with their families. They're not migrating. Children don't migrate. Children are moved places to flee disasters, wars, droughts, economic disasters, you know. And the same in, in this field of woke where somehow teaching about the history of racism in the United States is defined as a terrible thing. How, how could anyone say teaching history is bad? You know, talking about the history of slavery, how that affects people who are African American today, I, I think it's essential for all of us, black people, white people, everybody else, to understand that. And so that's how I approach these issues of prostitution and trafficking. Prostitution is um, a very sexually objectified activity. If in, in the words of some survivors, it's the essence of how you turn a woman into a secondary sex characteristics and nothing else. Or if a series of orifices is what women are in prostitution, or they're expected to be uh, AI-like talking girlfriends that are programmed to act like a girlfriend. There's nothing real about prostitution or how people are treated in prostitution, and it's all sexually objectified. The same is true about the idea that a man is defined by wearing the color pink or liking to play with dolls or girls liking to play with trucks. I mean, I'll tell you, it freaks me out today, Nick, to think that some five-year-old could enjoy playing with trucks or dolls. In other words, they're going against sex, what we used to call, I'm old enough to remember the movement to eradicate sex role stereotypes, which was that men could never wear a skirt, except maybe, I guess, Scottish guys. Um, uh, and women can never wear pants and like to uh, compete in sports and win, you know, win a math prize. That means you're kind of a boy. So it could be argued that um, woke is like the ultimate negation of sexual stereotypes. What, what would you say to that? It doesn't even make sense to me. To me, it's the maximum embracing of sex stereotypes. I, I'm in favor of not discriminating against any man who acts feminine, but it's feminine is defined by cultures. Feminine in Iran means you wear a burqa. Feminine in the U.S. means you wear what porn stars wear. No, that is what it means. Ask any 20-year-old who's going out on a date, and that's kind of what she's expected to do. But I, I don't even get the question, Nick. Could you explain that logic? Or Well, I mean, that's what uh, people that are advocates of woke are saying, is that this is the logical extension for what people on the left had been fighting for 30 years ago. Oh, I see. 
it's kind of, that's kind of the, you can turn into anything you want, literally. If yes. a man wants to have a baby, he can. Um, well, that's going to be a little tough, but, um, but well, yeah. No, he can have an artificial womb. Yes. This is the latest AI technology that's being developed as we speak. It's kind of terrifying if you think of yourself as I do as essentially a mammal, a rather predatory one. We descended from the chimps, not the bonobos. That's a shame, but that's that's a done deal. It's just how it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. But we're mammals. We're embodied. Human beings are embodied if, in a way. Don't you see this as extreme dualism, mind-body separation? Well, what I see is this is a woke is supposed to eradicate the problems that have been caused by sexism. But when you've got a man who decides to identify as a woman who has a history of sexual assault, and decides to be put in a woman's jail and assaults uh, additional women, um, that's not really leveling the playing field. It's um, it's actually a very bad idea. So Well, that's... People, people are realizing that now, which is a good thing, which is a really good thing. But yeah, I mean, my position is that I don't think anybody should be discriminated against because they don't meet gender role expectations or sexual sex expectations. In other words, women who act like men, that's okay with me. Men who act like women, that's okay with me. That doesn't mean they're literally and concretely women. And the reason I got into this is because once again, in history, this is about men's rights to do what they want, which there's a huge amount of pornography use on the part of young trans people. That's their defined young trans women, men who say they're women, define what a woman is by watching pornography. Shockingly enough. That's not how I would define myself as a woman. That's a, it's a biological thing based on the sex binary. But um, nonetheless, I don't think anybody should be discriminated against, but I think there's a line in the sand when men's assumed right to say they're women means that women, once again, are endangered just like you're saying, by putting a man with a beard and a penis who says, I'm a girl, into a women's prison in California, where I live, which is happening, hundreds of these men. I mean, it's, uh, it's a playground for, for rapists and men who get off on harming women. Or... And I, I actually sympathize with this. Any guy who doesn't want to be in a men's prison, I understand that. He doesn't want to be raped. Uh, unfortunately, it's extremely common, and it's even more common with gay men or men who are femi acting. So they should be protected, but they should not be protected by endangering women. And same with sports. Why do we have women's sports in the first place? because everybody knows their sex differences and women are not on a level playing field with men in upper body strength at all, never gonna be. It's not just about the pride of winning a sports championship for women, it's economic too, Nick. These men who say they're women who are beating women in swimming competitions, or running, or other sports, or in some cases causing uh, skull fractures if they're engaged in martial arts, which has also happened when men who say they're women compete in women's sports. 
it's not just about physical issues and who wins and who doesn't because of testosterone. It's also economic. Women, women go to college on sports scholarships. And when some dude comes along and says, I'm a girl and gets all the scholarship money, what's wrong with this picture is what I would say. A lot, a lot is wrong. I first got into this when a, a man who said he was a woman wanted to volunteer at a rape crisis center in Vancouver, Canada. In fact, Vancouver Rape Relief is the oldest women's shelter in the country of Canada. They've been in existence for decades. Women did not feel safe in a rape crisis center with a man as their counselor, volunteer counselor. And so the guy was rejected politely and became enraged and went on to engage the Wokarati in Vancouver, who then removed government funding as an act of vengeance. This is not in the interest of women. You know, if, if a man <clears throat> wants to help other men who are being battered, I absolutely support that. But if a woman, and there are many more women, that are harmed by men beating them up than there are men harmed by women beating them up. If a man wants to offer support and help to another man who's being beaten up and it does happen and they deserve support, good, go for it. Let's have that happen, but not at the cost of endangering women. It's gotten so woke, so woke in San Francisco. I was at a playground few years ago, which is where you learn a lot about human behavior. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, I've, uh, I've seen, uh, yes, New York boxes. Yeah. So I was taking care of some kids and um, uh, about a 12 year old girl came over crying next to uh, talking to her mom who was sitting near me. And the mom said, what, what's the matter? What's the matter? And the kid said, he called me a trans bitch. And the mother comforted the kid. Remember, this is San Francisco. The mother comforted the kid. And um, a couple minutes later, the mother got up with a firm look on her face, walked over to the caregiver. And she was gone for 10 minutes talking. And when she came back, sat down. She said, I said, uh, what, what did you say? What did you say to the caregiver? And she said, with a satisfied smile on her face, I told him in our school, trans is not an insult. We love trans kids. We appreciate trans people. There's nothing wrong with being trans. You can't call somebody trans as an insult. And after she finished that, she looked at me and I looked at her and I said, did you say anything about that boy calling your daughter a bitch? And I got a blank look, Nick, <laughs> real blank look. Somehow this word trans has superseded the word that women are called when a fist is pulled back and violence is perpetrated against them. The word that is most commonly used in the United States to insult, degrade, and precede violence against women. Let's face it, a lot of women know that. Disappeared. The word was disappeared. This concerns me. <laughs> it's interesting because woke has the, uh, ostensibly has the outward appearance of equalizing all, but again, it's coming back to really hurt women. And uh, so basically, although it's has a very different window dressing, um, it's taking in with it uh, sexist, violent attitudes that have existed yeah. forever. There's some amazing films out now 
about that issue from filmmakers like uh, Vaishnavi Sundar has a film that you can locate easily on the internet called Dysphoric, Fleeing Womanhood Like a House on Fire. She The film is about adolescent girls who want to be men at puberty in order to, to escape the pressure of patriarchal sexism that comes down on every woman who's an adolescent, um, all of us. And that's a wonderful film. And then Jennifer Law and Joey Bright, both Californians, have done films about puberty blockers, which is really nothing sort of, short of scandalous along the lines. It's a medical, it's going to be exposed as a medical scandal along the lines of lobotomy, I think, Nick, one of these days. These are, these are drugs, puberty blockers, and which are 90, once a kid goes on puberty blockers, there's a 90% likelihood they're going to then go on to either estrogen, if they're a boy who identifies as a woman, or testosterone, if they're a girl who identifies as a man. Those drugs sterilize kids. Adolescent and pre-adolescent children are being sterilized. Furthermore, boys get uh, osteoporosis if they're put on estrogen. There, there are severe consequences, cardiovascular consequences. These hormones are very strong uh, in the human body and we're not meant to be flooded with them. What would you say there's an argument out there that says that someone knows that they're gay at a very young age and um, and people are trying to extrapolate that to knowing that they're male or female despite their X or Y chromosome? What, what would you say to that? That's That's an important question, I think. First of all, Sexual orientation, that is being lesbian, gay, or bisexual, is not the same thing as gender identity as defined by the Wokarati and the alphabet people, LGBTQ, RS, and the whole long line. Every, every week there's a new flag, a new, frankly, sexual fetish added to the list. So sexual orientation, being attracted to the same sex, uh, being heterosexual is not the same thing. It's kind of different. Do I think people know they're gay at the age of three? I, I'm not sure that's a thing. Uh, how about six or 10 though? I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. I've, I've heard people say they knew they were gay. Um, at early ages, but it's it's a sexual orientation. So to me, it's kind of adolescent or post-adolescent, frankly. But it's a sexual orientation. It's a sexual preference. It's not the same as gender identity. I'm a girl. I'm a boy because I say so. And that's what it's turned into. The there was this insane situation in Scotland, which has resulted in the deposition of the prime minister of Scotland because she got real confused about this issue. There was a law in Scotland that said when a rapist is charged with rape, which usually means a penis in someone if in a female's orifice, if a rapist says... If a rapist with a penis says he's a woman, the rape gets logged as female on female rape. Nick, what's wrong with this picture? I, I, I use statistics to make my point about violence against women. This insane, you want to talk real insanity. It's not Eileen Warnos. It's the government of Scotland that says when a rapist with a beard and a penis comes in and says, I'm a woman, and the victim says, he raped me, 
it gets logged as a woman. Well, there again, it, it's using um, it's it's perpetuation of sexual violence um, under a new guise, really. Under new camouflage. It's under camouflage. new, yes. I mean, it's scary. I was in uh, Southern California for about three weeks, and I was taking care of my uncle, my late uncle's uh, affairs. And uh, most of his friends were, you know, far right type guys, and um, none of them are really going to be drinking Budweiser anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they they made that explicit to me that um, that that they're going from Bud Light, and a number of them did express an, a major affinity for Bud Light, but uh, it seems that they're going to be going to Miller Light at this point. Have you ever seen Dylan Mulvaney in a video? I, I haven't had that good fortune yet. Okay. I would recommend you check it out because my objection to Anheuser-Busch and, you know, and Budweiser is not that it offends my morals or anything else. It's that if you look at the man whose picture is on Bud Light, a, a young man named Dylan Mulvaney, who says he's a girl, he's had turning into a girl, he's a total social media influencer right now. He was originally a gay actor who lost all of his employment during COVID and then decided he was trans and then decided he was a woman. And he's had multiple, multiple surgeries. What is the problem for feminists with Dylan Mulvaney? If you look at what he does, the first day of being a girl, Dylan Mulvaney said something like, oh, I left my wallet in, and he talks in this kind of a voice. I left my wallet in the store. My period started and I got all discombobulated. It's, it's a parody of being female. It's really a parody of who we are. And what I would say to someone like Mulvaney is, hey, the woman, was it in, where, where did she live? Portland or Seattle or something that, that defined herself as African-American and said she felt black all her life, even though she wasn't. And she kinked up her hair and she put tanning on, and she went to the NAACP and made con contributions to the NAACP. And then someone, she was discovered to be white, Norwegian or something. The entire United States was outraged about that. You tell me what's the difference between black face and woman face, because I don't get the difference. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> our our world is blaspheming with, <laughs> Craziness. with many conundrums. <laughs> yeah, I, that's postmodernism to me. That's the nihilistic thing. I can be whatever my little brain says I am. If I'm white, I can be black, and screw you. You hey, you you African American people who who been through different experiences and have different uh, melatonin and different lives than me, that doesn't matter. What matters is my identity. That's more important than you. I don't know. <laughs> uh, the world is uh, getting crazier and crazier. Um, I do not know where it's going to lead us at this point. Um, hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully, Humanity can be restored to sanity, but um, that would mean that humanity at one point did have sanity. Um, this is a this is a question for far more um, <laughs> gifted philosophers than myself <laughs> and, and me. <laughs> but I think your point is well taken. We're not really rational creatures, and a lot of humans think they are. I. I think we need to embrace and understand 
our irrationality and, and kind of quit thinking we're the superior creatures on the planet. We're really not. We're, we're not a whole lot better than a lot of other living beings on the planet. So, Well, for me, the first requisite of having sanity is questioning my sanity. Um, if I can do that, I can be, I think, somewhat sane. Um, there's a lot of people that cause tremendous carnage in this world, um, our politicians included, that never question their sanity. Right. It's true. And on that <laughs> optimistic note, I really want to thank you for coming on the Nick Bryant podcast, Melissa. Nick, thank you for chatting with me. I appreciate your work and everything you're doing. Thank you for that. And uh, have a great day in San Francisco. Thanks. Okay, bye. You have a good one too. Bye. bye.